Okay, so today we're going to talk about the disappearance of Johnny Gosh. Johnny Gosh was a 12-year-old paper, paper delivery boy from West Des Moines, Iowa. He disappeared September 5th, 1982. Um, very intriguing case. A lot of rabbit holes you could go down if uh, you know if you wanted to. There seems to be at least a, a couple of plausible explanations as to what happened to him. And remember, what I'm doing here is not um, trying to solve the case. I'm not investigating the case. Just like a lot of these, most of these that I'm doing, it's more to bring awareness to the case. And therefore, you know, get it out in the public opinion. Let people see what I see just from the... Uh, research that I did and again I don't have police reports or anything like that so it's a little bit difficult um, but it's still okay to get it out there and that's what we're doing here so Johnny Gosh uh, 12 year old paper boy so the, let's start with uh, a timeline and and this is the timeline of the morning and it goes along with victimology which obviously is very important so he gets up every Sunday to deliver the newspaper now that's not unusual back then I had a friend named Frank in Pittsburgh uh, when I would visit my grandparents he would do the same thing Sunday morning get up very early and we'd go deliver the newspapers so when I would visit my grandmother and grandfather out there um, he had this job for about a year he got it and what goes into victimology is that he was saving to buy a, a motorbike a dirt bike and he did so he was a very responsible uh, 12 year old boy he played on the football team he was athletic he did not get into a lot of troubles he spoke out against drugs they came from a a middle upper middle class uh, neighborhood where there's not a lot of trouble he gets up every morning or I'm sorry at least every Sunday morning and his father who is a former Marine from what I understand um, and the reason I bring that up obviously is because I'm a Marine so uh, whenever I get a chance to state that I do um, his father would help him usually on Sundays in some aspect. I'm not sure if that's to go help with the deliveries or at least get him up, get him ready, whatever it was. But on this Sunday, he didn't. Now, most times, something unusual like that, it raises red flags. It does not for me. But uh, Johnny, by all accounts, gets up. He goes and meets on the corner where they would get their newspapers. You know, that's where the, all the newspapers would be dropped off. And then the newspaper carriers would come there. And, of course, they would get uh, their newspapers distributed into their bikes, their carrier bags, whatever it may be, and move on. So once these boys got their newspapers, they would go in their separate directions and do their routes. By all accounts, it, there was two vehicles in the area that kind of were involved in this by involved I mean we're at least in the location doesn't mean that they're suspects although some would like to claim that um, there was a Ford Fairmont and there was another blue car that seemed one had stopped and asked Johnny for directions 
now it's a little muddy because I during my research I'm trying to find these exact witnesses and their names and it's hard to come by believe it or not because there's so many articles and stuff but one account has somebody asking Johnny for directions after Johnny gives directions the guy goes and asks the other carriers for the exact same directions and I believe it was the 86th Street uh, that is odd to me unless Johnny says I don't know where that is and then the individual goes and asks the other boys then I can buy that but if Johnny tells him and he should know because Johnny lives on 45th Street he should know where 86th is and should be able to give directions so if he does that and this individual drives up to another set of boys and asks him I find that odd there is another account by another witness who says that the individual asked Johnny about something Johnny said he didn't know he was scared he was gonna go deliver his routes and the guy flipped his dome light three times and as Johnny was walking away somebody came from in between the houses and followed him Johnny made it to a little past a corner um, up from where he had picked up his newspapers and somebody in that house saw a vehicle come by where Johnny was standing heard a car door slam and next thing you know Johnny Gosh has vanished his red wagon with his newspapers are still there and so his his, his dog he had a small dog that came with him so that's what we got now what is it well it can only be two things right it can only be that he ran away or it was an abduction when the the newspaper uh, needy people who were expecting their Sunday morning paper and this is at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning did not get their said newspaper they started making phone calls those calls went to Johnny's house because everybody knows that Johnny delivers their newspapers that's how it was back in the day um, uh, days gone by the good old days ripe for abduction by that I mean in the 80s we had a lot of freedom there was no kids staying at home on their internet everybody was out on their bikes meeting at somebody's house um, if you ever watched the Netflix series stranger things um, it was kind of like that not with the aliens or the monsters or anything like that it's just you rode your bikes that's how you got together and you went and did things at each other's homes so when they didn't get their newspapers they started calling Johnny's parents knew something was wrong right away so they contacted police police did not show up to their doorstep for 45 minutes um, do I see anything wrong with that in hindsight yes at the time uh, maybe not the police did not take this serious as it was an abduction they took it as what I had said earlier which is he ran away it would take approximately 38 seconds to realize this kid didn't run away okay all you would have to do is look at his wagon and the dog and realize he didn't run away now if you wanted to take that a little bit further and go into his victimology so it might take a minute and 30 seconds to realize this wasn't a runaway situation what frustrates me you know hindsight is always 2020 I get that but when you have something that doesn't make sense uh, I guess it's like that in any vocation that you have whether you're an electrician you're a plumber 
you have individuals who take their job seriously and you have people that don't and are there just for a paycheck make no mistake about it the police departments are the same way they always have been they always will be people take the job for different reasons there are great ones they are passionate they're empathetic they do their job correctly and there's some that it, they don't really care that's the facts of life that, that's just the way it is just think about when you hire um, somebody to come work on your house you want the best person there well police and victims family are no different about police you want the best should they have come faster than 45 minutes yeah I'm sure they didn't have anything going on at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday other than their time but what bothers me the most is within less than a minute, any competent, caring law enforcement personnel would know that that is not a runaway. That is not how you do it. If you want to run away at 6 in the morning, you get up without telling anybody just and go. You don't take a dog and leave him alongside the road. You don't take the extra step of going and getting your papers. Come on, that doesn't make sense. That bothers me so much that police can't figure this out. Wasted time. They should have immediately been on this. Now, how do I know that they didn't take it serious right away? Well, I looked at the quotes from the newspaper the very next day and some of the things that they were saying like uh, and I wrote one down here Gene Meyer whoever he is he's a criminal investigator there said the very next day there is no indication he was kidnapped well what else could it be Are aliens gonna come down and abduct this kid a bolt of lightning gonna come and strike him and evaporate him use your head sure if you want to be literal and say there's no indication that he was kidnapped because there was no struggle what kind of struggle are you going to see if his cart was upside down and his papers were scattered then would you say there was an abduction all you have to look is he left his dog there it's an abduction he the kid didn't run away i don't know if it was just the mentality back then I I hate being critical of law enforcement especially back then I'll be critical of a department that I worked with that I saw with my own two eyes and I have knowledge of them not doing correctly but it's hard for me to do it to when I have no first hand knowledge but when I see quotes and I know Quotes can be taken out of context and stuff like that. But, come on. From what I see, piss poor job. So, Johnny Gosh has vanished. There are significant leads that need to be followed up. The two vehicles that are in the area much like the Springfield 3 where there was a peeping Tom not weeks leading up to that event I'm talking hour leading up to that event that needed to be followed up on that's significant I can't I can't emphasize that enough so in this case it is very significant those two vehicles now, it's not that simple. This case. This case then, if we jump forward in the timeline, an individual named Paul Bonici came forward and said he actually abducted Johnny Gosh. And he did this at the bequest of 
a pedophile ring. So people that were snatching children and, and selling them off as human trafficking. Now, I, I'll be the first to admit I'm not an expert on human trafficking, and it's something that uh, I have recently started to look into further because it's a thing. Now this, I believe you could narrow down to one of two things. Just like we've, I, and I'm sure you, and I hope law enforcement now realize that if it's a, an abduction or a runaway, we're getting rid of the runaway and it's an abduction. But what type of an abduction? There's only two possible abductions to me that it is. A human trafficking thing, which I think is certainly plausible, or a sexual predator, which is certainly possible and maybe probable. We'll get to that. Now, Johnny Gosh's mother, who gets, I don't know, it seems like she gets a bad rap. She was difficult to work with, this and that. Um, I just think she was very passionate about getting her son back, and the police weren't doing her job. So I think she has every right to act the way she did. She believes wholeheartedly in this Paul Benicio, who says, hey, I kidnapped him off the street, I chloroformed him, and he was sold into sex trafficking. I, myself, Paul Benicio, molested him and did these things to him. So he came forward again in 1991. Both parents went and met with Paul. The dad never told the mom that he had gone. He does not believe him for various reasons. Height discrepancy. Um, he had talked to the guards in the prison where Paul was. And he said his cell was littered with Johnny Gosh stuff. Newspaper articles and stuff where he could have gotten information. Mom went and seen him years later. And she believes him. He talked about a brand that these kids would get when they would be kidnapped and Johnny being one of them. He, Paul, has been diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. Doesn't mean that he's a liar. Paul said that this was a grand conspiracy of higher level individuals that are involved in this sex ring and eventually Paul ended up suing an individual I want to say his last name was King for this abduction and stuff now this is where things get convoluted but the gist of it is that he won a settlement against this King for a monetary amount. So there has to be some sort of credible testimony and I did read the transcript. Now, I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole too far, okay? So you have this Paul's testimony against King over here saying there's a conspiracy between higher level people and kidnappings and it's being sold into sex trade and all that but then you have just the abduction of Johnny over here and that's what I wanted to focus on but it has to come back to here a little bit and during this civil suit I was able to read testimony of Noreen Gosh Johnny Gosh's mom and this is where things really took a turn for me because it was during this civil suit, and this was in 1999, that Noreen stated under oath that 
she actually had been visited by her missing son Johnny two years earlier in 1997. Now, I told you things get interesting, right? Johnny went missing in 1983, September 5. I'm sorry, 1982, September 5. Noreen, who is a big advocate, always in the newspapers, doing as much publicity as she can. And that's what you should do, in my opinion, when you have a missing child. In 19... 97, she says she gets a knock on her door at 2.30 in the morning. And it's Johnny and another guy. She recognizes him, but yet he wants to prove it by showing her a birthmark that he has on his chest, supposedly. But she doesn't need to see that. She knows it's him. He comes in. They speak for an hour and a half. He confirms everything that Paul had been saying that he's been sold into trafficking and he's scared and he wants her to do something about it. But he doesn't want her to tell anybody. Johnny keeps looking at this other guy for approval to speak. He leaves after an hour and a half Mom doesn't tell anybody until this federal civil suit, I believe it was a civil suit or a federal case, under oath. Now, what do I think about that? Well, I wrote down a little bit of a timeline here just to wrap my head around what she's saying. So, a couple of things that I wrote down in this timeline. Not only that he disappeared September 5th, 1982, but in Oct on October 8th, 1982, mom and dad refused polygraphs. So on October 8th, 1982, you're talking one month after the abduction of Johnny, the parents refused polygraph. Now in today's world, man, would that raise such a big flag, right? Um, but it didn't then, but it still made headlines. I find that, and I wrote it down here, stupid. Not stupid that they refused, that the stupid that the police even gave him polygraphs. This was clearly an abduction. Why the, they even approached the Grieving parents to do a polygraph, I think, is asinine. It is ludicrous. I don't understand why they would do this. All that's going to do is create a riff. And then there probably was one right away because Johnny's parents obviously felt like they were not doing, the police were not doing enough. And I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, but as a missing person's parents, I would probably assume that they felt that way. But why would you even... Now, if they had something that I don't know about, but you have witnesses that saw Johnny getting the newspapers, crossing the street, being spoken to by at least one individual in a car um, I don't see how a parent is involved in that so why go down that road of offering a polygraph when it's not relevant I don't understand why they did that um, but that was again one month after the abduction in 1985, a dollar bill surfaces that says, I'm, I'm alive, Johnny Gosh. I um, think you could throw that right out the window as a prank. But the parents hold on to that, right? Because it gives them hope. And then again in 91, this Paul Bonucci, Bonucci comes forward. 
and gives all this information about the, the trafficking, the sex trafficking, and mom jumps on this, I believe. She jumps on that bandwagon because that's what she believes. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. In 99, I'm sorry, this was in 91, Bonichi comes forward. In on August 28th of 97, she is quoted, Noreen, Johnny's mom, in the paper saying that she received information that Johnny is alive, he's married, and he can't come forward because of repercussions. But that's what she has information on. So that's August of 97. Now, I find it odd that she testifies in the trial that in March of that same year of 97, she says she was visited by Johnny. Johnny made no mention, at least she didn't say, that he was married. But yet in August of 97, she is quoted in the paper saying that he's married and he can't come forward. I find that discrepancy troublesome. So fast forward from 97 to 1999 where she testifies at this court proceeding under oath that Johnny came to visit her. Do I believe her? I want to believe her. Why would she lie about that? I I never want to question a victim's family. But in this case, I have to because it doesn't make sense to me. Now, I'm not calling her a liar. Maybe she believes it. But from what I see and the things that I I read in the transcripts and stuff that she describes, uh, I just I have a hard time believing it and I don't believe it. Now, she says, you know, you're just like your question is, why didn't she go to police if he came to the house and visited? After being, he was 27 years old then. You know, he had been missing, I don't know, 15 years. You don't tell anybody? You don't tell the father? They had split up in 1993. They had divorced. Johnny didn't tell the father this. He didn't go visit the father. And how did he find her? They had moved. They had divorced and she had gotten an apartment. They had gone their separate ways. Wouldn't Johnny have gone to the old house on 1004 45th Street where he lived? Wouldn't he go there? How did he track her down? I guess he could have maybe gotten a phone book. I don't know if her name was listed then. Those things don't add up to me. And why wouldn't he visit his dad? Why the mom? in an apartment where he did not know that she lived. So, we have that. Another question is, this Paul Benucci says that all the kids had a brand. You know, like a cow brand. Almost like tattoos, right? But it's a, it's a brand. And all these stolen and abducted kids that were being trafficked had these, this brand. And they actually brought forward somebody who had this same brand. And he showed it. And it matched. Why didn't, why didn't Johnny show his mom this brand? They knew about it at the time. Why didn't she, why didn't she do a lot of things? Okay. Now she says it was to protect him. Didn't take a picture of him. I would have jumped on him, sat on him, 
held on to him, hogtied him. I'd have done whatever I could for him not to leave that apartment. Because her actions afterwards, to me, are troublesome in a way as well. Because now she knows he's alive. Because he has come and visited her, right? I mean, she's testifying to this. And she's telling everybody this. Um, well, she didn't for two years. She didn't tell anybody. Because he said not to. And that's the reason she didn't. But then she testifies to it. It's all out there in the open. Everybody knows about it. So she receives a package on her doorstep in 2006. And I guess some of the pictures supposedly showed Johnny gagged and hogtied. And this is troublesome to her and this and that. Why? Why would that be troublesome to her now that she knows he's alive? So if she received these pictures in 2006 and she releases them and she's troubles, but why? If she knows he's alive, is it to bolster her claim? Uh, that might be it. I can't discredit her. If she says that her son came and visited, You should accept it as that, right? It's a tough one. It's it, it's a, it's tough. Chief Orville Cooney, who was the police chief at the time, I think he made some very dumb decisions, and such as the statements he made that he didn't give a damn what Noreen thought, that he had a job to do. That's not how you... That's not how you do things. You don't say that. Okay? The reason you don't say it is because there are victims. There's victims' families. They're hurting. I get so irritated at police officers who have no empathy. Can't stand it. My number one pet peeve. If they call you, call them back. If they come to visit you and they're crying, you be empathetic towards their needs. But again, just like any vocation, you have people that care, you have some that don't. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. And some of those people make their way up to supervisor, to corporal, to sergeant, chief detective. And they are going to be a reflection of their people. And it's just, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to search out, you know, the ones that care. And a lot of times that is private detectives. That's just the way it works. So, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there was another paper boy that was abducted on August 12, 1984. So, almost two years and one month to the day when Johnny was taken that Gene Martin was abducted. Now, police cannot connect the dots to that, but you cannot dismiss that. Is it the same person? Very well could be, and why? See, that why is always very important, because you want to know those things. You can't just arbitrarily say they're linked. You have no evidence of that. But when something is successful, I want you to think about Ted Bundy and how he started abducting women. How he evolved from breaking into homes and taking them out to wearing his arm in a sling, getting them to his car, using a ruse, hey, can you help me untie my boat, carry my books, cracking them on the head. and move. See how that evolution is? He went from something where he it was a little bit harder breaking into the house. You took more risk removing him from the house. You you can be seen. It's more of a risk. And he evolved to hey, I get him to my car where I can whack him and just put him in. It's simple. I'm out. Risk being seen. That's called evolution. And you do that when something is successful. So if you abducted. Johnny Gosh, two years earlier, on his paper delivery route, and you said, hmm, 
I'm ready for somebody else. Why not go back to the same thing that was successful two years earlier? Paperboy on that route. Maybe the abductor had a fantasy about paperboys. That is not out of the question. That is not out of the question. Now, uh, I saw somewhere where the FBI was being interviewed and they refused to comment on this case. And I, that bothered me. Now, there must be a reason for it. I don't believe that it's a cover-up, as a lot of people want to say. But I don't understand why they wouldn't comment on it. That's troublesome to me. So what can what what do we know? What can we say? Well, I can say that number one, it was certainly an abduction. Whether it was to human traffic or was it a single or maybe double um, pedophile who is working for himself for his own gratification it, it's one of the two and I can't narrow it down I can't the thing about a witness seeing the dome light being switched on and off three times I have a hard time with that I, I have a hard time with that um I like to simplify cases if I can. And by doing that, in this case, I see somebody in those cars, either the first car or the or the Ford was it Ford Fairmont abducting him either alone or with somebody. I can't see a team coming there and abducting Johnny specifically. I think it was more of an opportunity. And by that I mean I think it was certainly planned in advance. I think, and I guess I'll say it, a single individual Who had stalked, and by stalked, I don't mean, I just mean not Johnny in particular, but that age group, 10 to 13. Those were paper delivery boys. He knew that those paper delivery boys were there, were doing their thing. He had probably driven there the previous Sunday, probably the previous Sunday. He knew the route where they were going to be. Maybe he did lock on to Johnny in those previous uh, Sundays. I don't think that somebody would just happen upon driving through the area, see Johnny, and abduct him. I don't believe that. It had to be planned. It had to be. It had to be planned in advance. So many witnesses, I mean, no one really saw the actual abduction. I guess there was two people that came forward, two newspaper delivery boys who said they saw Johnny slumped over in the car, but then later that was recanted, and this was brought out by the private investigator. So I don't know how true that is. I would love to see the police reports. I did see one page of the police report, uh, but it didn't give me a whole lot. Uh, I'd like to see all of it. Um, so I don't, I don't, I'm not buying that. You have, you have people that witnessed almost like the pre-abduction, which is the questioning of Johnny by somebody in the vehicle. And maybe, maybe that individual said, Hey, I'm going to get him." Open up the door, roll down the window, whatever it was. Hey kid, where is 86th street? 
And witnesses said this guy looked like he was drunk. He looked like he was wide awake. Um, he looked like he was off. Maybe because he was anxious. Maybe it was because he was drunk. A lot. Of, Ted Bundy got drunk a lot before he abducted people. Um, so it, it's possible. And maybe he was getting ready to do it, but noticed a witness. And said, okay, I'm not. And went down, turned around, came back again until he saw Johnny alone. Maybe that's when he said, hey, where is this place? I can't find it. Can you show me on this map? Johnny walks over, throws him inside. Could be that simple. Has a gun, get in or I'm going to kill you. Now, when did I think this happened? There was a little detail that I saw that I may or may not mean nothing. But that's why it's always important to get a fresh set of eyes on things. There are like a metal binding clip like a binding like a clothes hanger I guess that goes around the newspapers and they have to be snipped off before they can be delivered and Johnny had just picked up his newspapers he had gone around to the corner where he was abducted and the newspapers were found clipped which means Johnny had to clip them I believe that's when he was abducted okay when he stopped walking clipped them and he was abducted. He obviously, I don't think, would be clipping them while he's pulling his wagon. That doesn't make sense. He had to have stopped. <sighs> the dog was small. Therefore, it wouldn't be a threatening dog. Uh, it, I find it odd that if Johnny was physically abducted, thrown into the car, it, why that dog didn't start barking. Maybe he did. But I read nothing to that account. I think I could have spent um, every day for a month investigating this or, or just researching it, not even investigating. And I would have found out something new on that. I went right to the police, or not the police reports, the newspaper accounts, and that's where I got most of my information on this case. Uh, they can be wrong, surely, but I trust them more than I do rumor and innuendo from a web sleuth Twitter board or whatever the hell it is uh, I don't even read that stuff because things get so the further away you get from the crime the more you get away from facts and the more things just start getting like a black cloud above it and pretty soon you don't have anything that resembles the truth so I seen that his wagon was on display somewhere. Um, I actually thought that was pretty cool to keep his memory alive like that. I like that. The case I, I noticed when I was reading through the newspaper articles that the police actually listened to psychics the mom did too Noreen and uh, uh, you know how I feel about psychics I just I don't believe in them at all but for the mother to believe in it I understand for the police to take credence in it that bothered me a little bit shows to me it showed a lot of desperation but uh, whatever to each their own I always say that um, I don't judge people for what they believe in. I just know what I believe in. <sighs> Johnny Gosh, man. Is he still alive? I think I think he could be. I think remember what we want to do. We want to deduce possibilities to probabilities. It is possible he's alive. In this group photo of these people being kidnapped, and supposedly the guy on the right, the kid, is Johnny. I don't think you can tell that. Don't even know if this is true. Apparently, this is from a case in Florida. And the actual investigating officer identified the kids and said that's not Johnny. So, again, I think maybe it's a, it's a hoax in a way that it was given to Johnny's mom. 
it, but it is certainly possible that he's alive. We've seen it with Amanda Berry and some other people that have been uh, Sean, Sean Hornback that have been kidnapped, assaulted, brainwashed, and they're alive. That's certainly possible. Possible that the mom got a visit from Johnny at 2.30 in the morning. I just don't believe it. I, I just don't. Uh, I won't venture to say whether he would be alive or dead. Um, there's no evidence, I don't think, to support either in a substantial amount to be able to determine that. Let me think here for a second. I just... If it happened to Sean Hornbeck almost the same way, I mean, it's possible that he's still alive. But he certainly was taken. He was not kidnapped for ransom. Okay? He was taken for one purpose only. And that's sexual assault. And that's scary. It's so scary how, how that is so powerful in people that they can't control it. It's scary. I would venture to say that I, I guess I, I can go out on a limb a little bit. I'd venture to say that Johnny Gosh is not alive. After all these years, would he not have showed up again to his mom? If you follow the statistics, I would assume that Johnny was murdered within hours of being abducted. Much like we are now finding out about Brittany Drexel. They're not held captive forever. Now, in some cases, yes, they are. Don't get me wrong. But, if you're a statistics person, if you're a gambling person, they're, that's not how it happens. They're abducted, they're murdered and raped and discarded. Whether that's being buried, whether that's being thrown on a ditch, whatever it is. Missing person cases are very difficult. A lot of times because you don't have a crime scene. And... You don't have a, a secondary crime scene, which is a body dump location. You have nothing really to go on other than where, at least in this case, where he went missing from. And we know that from where his wagon was. An affluent neighborhood, middle class neighborhood, nice neighborhood, where not a lot of happenings going on. <coughs> at 6 in the morning. Now who's out at 6 in the morning on a Sunday? Most people are sleeping in. It's somebody that probably had fantasized about this until they took the leap. Now, could it have been a team of people that banded together in this sexual human trafficking and targeted Johnny? Possible. Possible. But again, remember, you don't have to make things so complicated. I think any one of those people could have been victims that day. Maybe Johnny was abducted because he separated earliest from the group when they picked up their papers. Maybe he was in a location that was dark and the killer, the abductor, saw his opportunity and he seized it. It certainly could be that. What bothers me is that he is 12, but he's he's what five seven, 
145 pounds, athletic. Hard. It's not hard to control somebody. Like, it's not what I'm saying. You have a gun, you can control somebody. When you're scared, you can be controlled pretty easily. So the individual had to have had a weapon. Unless he knew the individual. But you can almost rule that out because he's not going to get into a vehicle and leave his papers there because he's very responsible. And we know that through victimology. And that's why victimology is important because you can start eliminating some things. He's not going to get into a car with somebody he knows and just leave his newspapers there unless he is being threatened with bodily harm. Right? There are so many missing kids in the United States that it's it's so disgusting. It's almost unfathomable. But it is what it is. It happens. It's uh, You can't turn a blind eye to it. And this case is a perfect example of it. So, that's it on Johnny Gosh. This video is a little bit different. Is I'm doing it more to get just get it out there again. And let people... Maybe I saw something that nobody else seen. I doubt that. Um, but... I can't make a determination one way or another. I can't make a, a revelation. You know? I can't do that. I can just say he was abducted. And I don't think that certainly is not groundbreaking. I think everybody knows that. And it was either through human trafficking or a sexual predator. No, human trafficking is sexual predator too. But that is more of an organized conspiracy it could certainly have been that but it could have been a lone person that lived you know within five ten miles from where that abduction happened it's one or the other I'm very confident in in that but other than that a lot of twists and turns a lot of a lot of rabbit holes you can go down and I don't want to go down those rabbit holes the only rabbit hole that I wanted to go down and address was Johnny coming back to visit his mom 15 years later. You make up your own mind on that, okay? But I do know that grieving parents, and I've met a lot of them, will do and say almost anything to satisfy in their brain and in their heart that their child is okay. So, think about Johnny Gosh, think about his red wagon, and I pray that he's alive. Although, my brain tells me that that's probably not the right assumption to make but my heart tells me that it is so maybe I'll be like Noreen and go with my heart and believe that he's alive that's it for Johnny Gosh until next time on Unsolved No More Mains out